Hey, I'm Cindy Fisher. I'm with the Black Belt News Network, and I'm here with Charles Sims, who is in town from Memphis here in Selma. It is Jubilee Weekend 2024, uh, Saturday, and you have been, you just came back from the Foot Soldiers Breakfast. What do you think about, um, well, let's back up. Sure. So you're here as a uh, descendant of a Jim Crow author, mm. uh, and it sounds like you're doing a lot of reparation work and going to different communities. So tell us about your family and what made you want to do what you're doing today and why you're here in Selma. Sure, um, so first my three times great grandfather is Senator James Z. George of Mississippi. He was a three-term United States Senator, Chief Justice of the Mississippi Supreme Court and a Confederate General, but more importantly, he authored the 1890 Constitution of Mississippi which laid the blueprint and he became the primary architect of the Jim Crow laws. So obviously, John Lewis had to walk across that bridge because of laws that my great grandfather created. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was important to hear, important to come here to show um, support for um, the legacy of John Lewis and to build on the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Which is about, because uh, to the Jim Crow laws that really bothered you, mm -hmm. how do you feel like, how do you feel we are? doing with those laws now like have we come along sure way? so so there's been um, progress on legislation um, to improve voting rights obviously my great-grandfather had the biggest obstruction to the freedom and voting rights of black americans um, so that weighed on me and uh, the impact of that because it wasn't like four or five years like the american civil war it went almost 70 years mm -hmm. so it had a massive impact on our country and um, what would have happened without those um, interruptions or interferences? Where would the black community be? Where would black Wall Street be? Where would the, um, the finances be? So, um, but more importantly than that, it's important for me to show that no, ma no matter where we begin our journey, if it's in Oxford, Mississippi, or Memphis, Tennessee, or Selma, Alabama, uh, Selma, Alabama we have the ability to sit down, reach across party and racial lines, and talk about the things that divide us. I think that's a very important. Yeah, it is important. Uh, and voting rights is a big discussion. This year's theme is not just about ha you know registering to vote, but actually showing up sure, <laughs> at sure. the polls. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, it so it sounds like you've met with some pretty influential people. Have you met mm. with folks and talked to some people here in Selma? I have uh, just briefly at the uh, Foot Soldiers breakfast. I uh, spoke with a couple people. Um, some of the organizers uh, just got here just recently, so I'm just kind of hitting the ground and, and kind of getting a feel for everything. This is my first time in Selma, so I'm super excited to meet a lot of you know faith and community leaders and talk about the things that are going on and the grievances. But uh, but yeah, I thought it was important to kind of show that um, there's a lot of examples from the past of uh, reconciliation. You know, we look at all these examples from the 50s, 60s, 70s, we hear all these stories, but I think it's important to show modern examples um, yeah. because the world looks for us for leadership. And I'm not saying that I have all the answers, but what I am saying is that we have the ability to show that visual representation and crossing that the Edmund Pettus Bridge is an important thing. My family was, friends and colleagues with Edmund Pettus. So Edmund Pettus was at the secession convention in 1860, of which my great grandfather was at that, uh, a part of that body, and Edmund Pettus was also at his funeral. So it was important for me to come here to, um, to show that, um, to set certain things right, to show that Edmund Pettus and my great grandfather obviously had a, a big impact on racial codes and, and, and the history of the South. But it was important to show regardless of what they did, I'm here to do what I'm going to do. What's been the reception? How have people received your message? It's been uh, open. It's been openly accepted pretty pretty widely. And obviously, there's haters everywhere. You're never going to get away from people that don't support one thing or another. But uh, what I'm doing is going against very well laid plans of some very powerful and important people because division is power, both mm -hmm. right and left, both black and white. That both sides use it, and I would not be sitting here if I wasn't delusion or disin, disin, disingenuous with all politics. That's part of the reason why I'm sitting here today, because I feel like the government has failed us in many instances, and if the, if the government could have solved this, it would have already been solved. This is 
up to the people to solve this issue. And the government will never solve these type of issues. It's about bringing people together organically because when you have that coming together, that's what insulates us from um, gathering dangers abroad and outside of our country. Because regardless of the things that happen, if we come together, we can stand in that firmly and know that we have each other. It doesn't matter who wins the next election, when the next government shutdown occurs, because we have each other. And that's what achieving unity, what I call achieving unity in the community, or what Martin Luther King III may say, um, uh, the beloved community. I think that um, it's important. But Martin Luther King III uh, also said at the last, um, um, the last thing where they um, commemorated the dream speech that there has been work on the dream, but there's still progress to be done and everyone must play their part. And that's a small part that I have to play that, I believe when Dr. King said, I have a dream one day that the sons of former slaves and the sons of, form, uh, sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. So that's my part to try to get us a little bit closer in the vicinity of that beloved community is um, doing the hard things and, and having the hard conversations and, and putting that best foot forward to, to get that ball uh, rolling again and get the momentum uh, continuous that, that our brighter days are ahead of us. And even in places like Selma, Alabama or Mississippi, that we have the ability to come together and, and show that um, there is leadership in the South and we have the ability to, to come together and, and mend those old uh, divides and, and move past that old bitterness of the past. You know, I think that uh, the hatred of the past is, 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 has held on a long time, and, it, and I believe it's long past due that we move beyond you that. You have some hatred, of the, you have some hanging on to sure, absolutely. Uh, the, the kind of, I, I don't know, the false um, nostalgia. Mm. There's some false nostalgia that the 50s were the best time ever, but if you were to go back into the 50s and you were a black woman, would mm. you think it was the best time to be alive ever? Yeah, probably not. No. I mean, you could ask uh, Mammy Till if that was the best time, and I That's guarantee right. you she would tell you that it was not because her no. her son Emmett died under the system of oppression that my, my great-grandfather set up and, and someone like Rosa Parks. Like, the yeah. reason why she had to sit on that bus was, was, was an impact of my great-grandfather. Hmm. Same with John Lewis, like I previously stated about crossing Are there any other families that, that you have partnered with that are like yours or like what you're doing now? Or? I mean, it takes a very specific person to stand in the, in the truth that I do. And I think my life's journey has prepared me for that. Yeah, like how did you get here? What made hmm. you want to do this? So I never thought I would do anything like this. I think that uh, my military background and, and growing up in that melting pot of the, the army and, and in combat, um, my roommate in, in Baghdad in 2006 from, from Sierra Leone, West Africa. He wasn't even a citizen, but he was mm. my best friend. He was a citizen now. He just retired and um, just, he really rubbed off on me. He was just such a patriotic, genuine person. And I said, man, like this dude is just so patriotic. If, if, if I was able to learn from him, like what were the traits that I could take away from him? And he's just such an amazing person. But yeah, the army, my life's journey, the friendships, the relationships that I fostered over time, I had no idea that would lead me towards something like this. But I worked with a lady in 2010 that um, she was doing some political stuff and I reached back out to her and she was my connection to Martin Luther King's family. So I never even knew 15 years ago I was talking to the lady that would eventually um, connect me with Dr. King's family. But did you just like have a bad dream and just wake up one day like, I cannot keep going like this? No, so it was a confluence of events. I was like you were talking about earlier where you talked about the 50s and that, that thing for nostalgia. I had my own um, internal uh, kind of struggle with that because not only did my great-grandfather create the... Uh, the racial codes that became known as the Jim Crow laws, but one of his daughters was also the national president of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. So not in, only did we create the laws, we also built the statues. So mm -hmm. my great grandfather's statue is also in the in Washington. The two statues from Mississippi are Jefferson Davis and my great grandfather James E. George. Um, so obviously the nostalgia aspect, or looking back at it like that, I understand what you're saying, but. Um, um, The nostalgia part is one thing, but it's important to show that um, 
regardless where we come from, you still have that ability to reach across those party and racial lines. What would your great great grandfather think about what you're doing right now? I think he, uh, I think he would be in support of it, and that's part of the reason why I'm here, is because I went on kind of a deep dive to understand who I thought he was, and um, I think that he did what he did during a different time to protect his section. And it was up to other people to protect theirs. So I think what he did uh, in doing that was obviously to protect the white vote and to protect what he thought was important. Property. Fa farmers, owned, properties, pro yeah. obviously. And um, I think that, um, but I did, so I know the author that wrote his biography. I'm from the same town and he's a professor at UT Martin. So I spoke with him and I kind of wanted to learn certain things that made George, Senator George Tick as a person, and that's where I thought I saw the humanity in him. And certain things that I came across would have led me to believe that he would have been in favor of this. Um, and me, me, me speaking out, you know, I think that he was a product of the time. He was also a soldier. So that was the part I connected with is that um, his time as a soldier and how that maybe later on impacted his life or maybe soften him over time. He, he fought in the Civil War. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. He was captured twice and spent two and a half years in a northern prison camp and was paroled after the war. But, um, so he wasn't a great soldier. He was, he was a better, I guess. <laughs> well, he just got caught a lot. Yeah, he just got caught a lot. He was a, he was, uh, he was a lawyer who was obviously more of a legal mind than a soldier, but, uh, but yeah, he got caught a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think, um, Back to the nostalgia part, I think that people kind of try to hold on to certain things as long as they can until certain times move by them. And I think that time heals certain things. It doesn't heal everything, but it do, does heal certain things. And I think that's why it was up to me to step forward opposed to someone like my mother, uh, who I would have definitely thought that she would have been the person to assume a mantle like this. She was much more liberal, an attorney. Um, but just a very kind-hearted person. Like, she rubbed off a lot on me and, and kind of raised me a certain way to uh, look beyond race and color. But she wasn't ready. I don't think she was because she was so close to um, that time period. She grew up in the 50s and the 60s, so being able to, to just straight turn mm. dramatically the so other maybe direction. maybe it's the, the era, generation you're in. yeah. Yeah. is the one that it can accept it better. Well, I, I, like I said, I do think it was, without my specific life journey, I don't think I could be sitting here today. I think it was everything that brought me to that. I now, grew up, George Floyd. So George Floyd had a big, big impact on it, but I also grew up um, on the banks of the Tallahatchie River. I grew up about 200 yards from where the courthouse, where the murders in Emmett Till were trial. Uh, so there's a lot of things that kind of led me and told me that I was on the right path. My mom's dad went to uh, high school in Greenwood. He was in the same class with Byron D. LeBeckwith, who killed Medgar Evers. So there were so many things that kind of pointed that you're the person. Martin Luther King's bodyguard, primary bodyguard, you know what his name is? Mm -hmm. Charles Sims. Oh. <laughs> so there was a lot of small little things that I came across that said, you need to do this. You are the person to do this. Like I said, I thought someone in my family or someone like my mother would have been much better uh, situated because she was. She was a very kind person and had lived her life that way. I was the furthest person from who I thought should do something like this, but that's exactly why I thought I had yeah. to because Maybe it's the people the that you want that don't want to do it that need to do it, just like kind of like politicians we should have nowadays. They all, so they all want to be there. What's but, the future plan for you on this? Um, that's a good question. There's certain uh, short-term and long-term things that I wanted to uh, finish before I moved on. And to me, recharging and renewing and reinvigorating Dr. King's dream was first and foremost the most important thing to me. Mm -hmm. um, I think, like I said previously, Martin Luther King's son, Martin Luther King III, said that there has been progress, but everyone plays a part. So I believe that everyone does play a small part in achieving that dream. Obviously, he spoke about Alabama as well. 
there's people in Alabama that have a part to play towards achieving that part of it. But when he said, I have a dream, even in the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. Those are the reasons why I'm here, because I think it's, um, you know, I believe that I've been sending invitations through history when Dr. King reached out to me um, through that speech. But I believe it's more important than to just accept an invitation. You have to do the hard things to move that forward. Um, if we value unity, we have to be willing to talk about the things that divide us. If we um, believe in the dream, we have to be willing to live it and pray about it. It's not just um, talking. You have to walk the walk. And that's the difference with some people. People like to talk a big game, but they don't like to have, uh, you know, feet on the ground doing what needs to be done. And that's the hard part, standing in the reality. It's not for someone like me standing on the truth that I do. It's not the easiest thing all the time. But a lot of more people have done a lot more than I have in the journey to this to m move um, the needle forward. Look at what Martin Luther King and the people that went through in the last, uh, you know, 60, 70 years. You know, they went up through, uh, if I received a threat or one thing or another, it's not being on the streets where facing water hoses and dogs. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's a whole different story. Well, you're not alone. Um, and I think you're a good example. So I'm a legacy for you, United Daughters of the Confederacy. Are you really? Yeah, my mom's mom and her sister were super active in okay. UDC. And in fact, I didn't even know that until... Um, my my great aunt died and she's her funeral was at elwood mm -hmm. elmwood cemetery in birmingham bear bryant is buried there okay, okay. <laughs> which is important right for Alabama. big shout out bear bryant um, roll tide right roll tide <laughs> but but the the trick too is when i was when i showed up there were all these women in hoop skirts mm. and i'm like what's the deal mom <laughs> and it was because they were with U united daughters of yeah. the confederacy and that's when i started now i had one woman that sat with me and you know, she was telling me this story about uh, looking for the grave of a, of a general mm. that they had not found yet, Confederate general. Well, at the time, I worked at a newspaper in Birmingham, and I did a big story about it. It's not necessarily what you would do now, right? Sure. But that started my journey into my family tree mm. to find out the whole UDC thing and where was my Spark Confederate the curiosity. soldier. I didn't know anything about They didn't talk about it. So if you think, like, my generation, I'm Gen X, Mm -hmm. um, we didn't really even talk about it that much. I'm not sure if the millennials even talk about it that much. Like my kids that are Gen Z, I don't, I don't tell them that much about United Daughters of Confederacy. Sure. And but if I did, how would I present it to them so that they might get on the same journey? So that when you're asking for unity, mm -hmm. they can say, "Ooh, yeah, my, I've got a history that I, I grew up. I was told to say that it was states' rights." Sure. The fight, the, sure. the battle, the civil war. Now that's not okay, as mm. Nikki Haley learned. <laughs> mm. You can't dodge it anymore. You have to say it was the, that it was a fight for slavery mm. and against slavery. Um, but we, I grew up northern aggress aggression and and you know, states' well, rights. Yeah, obviously. So, uh, yeah, I, but I that up... was because we weren't okay with our past. Yeah. And that we had relatives that were willing to fight to keep something as awful as slavery. Mm. And it's just easier to swallow, right? So if, if you're representing someone with a, a much bigger person than I like to say that my soldier did not have slaves, was mm. probably not fighting for his own, but for the right to continue doing it, I'm sure I have to accept that now. I can't say states' rights anymore. So maybe you're on a journey to teach the next generation uh, what how they should accept their family history and what to do with it and how to stand for, up for it or against it. That's interesting that you put it like that because a lot of the older generation that I've talked to, I thought for me, historically, it would have been important first and foremost to try to connect with the older generation. But I still see so much pain in their eyes and yeah. in, in the events that they live through. Yeah. I don't know that if they're too set in certain ways to move beyond old grievances. And I think that they have the willingness to uh, hear you out and, and, and reach out to you, but I don't know how much you're willing to. Um, I think it's the, the sons and daughters, the grand, yeah. grand great, great mm -hmm. of these folks that, you know, I'm, I'm really listening to you saying, 
you know, I didn't expect that for so many years. Um, so maybe that's something that my family, I, I have had folks come through Selma over the years I've been here um, because they're coming here to do reparation mm. for uh, like, I moved up North, but we owned slaves in Grove Hill, for instance, mm-hmm. is one family that came through and they um, settled an estate. Someone died and they had written it in their will mm-hmm. to give money to this specific family in Grove Hill because it, they were their slaves, mm-hmm. their descendants of slaves that they had years before. Sure. That's pretty cool to be able to to narrow it to that mm-hmm. exact one you're repairing. Spe- very specific. Instead, it's more, you know, uh, and some reparations are happening without us being as intentional as you're being right mm-hmm. now. Because I see it in my kids that hang out with diverse other kids without thinking a thing about it. Sure. Yeah, for me, I think it's most important, like, obviously, when you talk about reparations, a lot of people have monetary um, things yeah, in, in, the, in their mind that come to mind immediately. And a lot of people that I've talked to, obviously, that's a that's a big talking point. But there's other things to show. There are other ways to do yes, it. Yes, there's other and ways some, to go beyond Some is that. just by accepting unity yeah. and trying harder to be accepting. I mean, you'd be amazed that some of the families and folks that I've talked to, like, last uh, a week ago, I was invited to Washington to a group uh, called the Descendants, and it was a historic yeah. group of descendants. And there was Thomas Jefferson, Ida B. Wells, Rosa Parks, uh, descendants from Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, just an amazing group That's of people. Amazing. And to be able to connect with uh, Reverend Wheeler Parker, the last remaining witness to the Emmett Till uh, abduction, mm-hmm. he held, held my hand and oh, wow. walked me through the Emmett Till Memorial at the Smithsonian. And I asked him, I said, did you ever think this would happen? He was like, not in a million years. Mm-hmm. Not from Mississippi and definitely not from your background. And he grabbed my hand and took me in there. And I was just. That must have felt really good. I mean, yeah, for me personally, for my family, it's a, I mean, like I said, I grew up a few hundred yards from the Tallahatchie River. It's a, it's a very personal thing for me. And um, for him, like to give him a hug and to, should, you know, to let him know that I'm like, I'm here for you. I'm here for your family. And regardless of the things that happened in the past, like let's move, let's move forward. So you have dream 2020. Mm. Is that a nonprofit? Yes, ma'am. And what is your goal for that group? So that's a good, that, um, so early on, I haven't accepted money from anyone. Like I haven't t- okay. taken any donations. That will be something that we'll do in the future. Cause I think it's important for fundraising for certain projects, but in the beginning, I didn't want to take any money from anyone. I wanted to show that I'm standing on this and, and, and my words alone. I didn't want anyone to say that anyone bought and paid for me, told mm. me to say something specifically. So for the last three years, I haven't taken a single donation, a single dime, a single penny from not a single individual, because I thought it was important to show that, um, you know, these were my ideas, my beliefs, and that's all I'm standing on. And so, yeah, in, in, in the future, we'll do some fundraising stuff to support certain uh, projects that we think, think are important. Oh, you'll have to keep us posted. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much absolutely. for joining uh, thank me. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome to Selma. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much. I'm Cindy Fisher, publisher of the Black Belt News Network. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Mm-hmm.